Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Matt Doss. I'm privileged to be the moderator today for today's breakout session called Congestion Pricing and Curb Management. Um, we have a, an excellent, well-qualified, lively panel today. Um, and we're going to proceed by each of us speaking a little bit about congestion pricing and curb management technologies and uh, policy, but it's going to be a mix and match. We're going to go jump back and forth from congestion to curb management. Then we have national experts, regional experts um, who are going to give brief presentations, including myself. Um, and we're going to then have questions and answers at the end for everybody together. So the order of speakers will be myself from New York. Um, then we have Sarah Abel, uh, who's from ITE. Uh, then we have Lindsay Bailey from CMAP, Jerry Quant from the Illinois Automated Vehicle Association, and then uh, my friend Dorn Miller from uh, Court. So without further ado, um, we're gonna jump right into it. So I'm gonna try to share my screen. And is it working? Yes. Yeah, everybody got that? Yes. yes. Great, excellent. Okay, so I'm gonna take a few minutes to talk about what's going on with congestion pricing, uh, what's happened so far, um, and where we are uh, in, in New York City, but also to focus on uh, shared mobility and what it means for shared mobility moving forward, especially with respect to um, what's going on with COVID. Um, so um, for those of you who don't know me, I was the longest serving, still longest serving chair uh, and commissioner of the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission. Before that, I was general counsel. I'm also president of the organization known as the International Association of Transportation Regulators. The IETR is a best practices group of um, regulators at the state and local level from all over the world, but in particular in the US, including Chicago's BACP. Um, you know, anyone you could possibly think of uh, gets their heads together and does best practices. Uh, we're proud to have uh, some C on our advisory board, Sharon's on our advisory board, and we work very closely together on both of our conferences. Uh, I've also been, uh, for the last 10 years as well, uh, Transportation Technology Chair at the City University of New York, City College, uh, where I teach graduate students and, uh, and, 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 and lecture and research. And uh, last but not least, I'm partner and chair for the last 10 years. We just celebrated our 10 year anniversary a few days ago uh, of the Transportation Practice Law Group at Wendell's Marks. Our firm's been around since the 1800s. We've survived world, war, war, world wars and uh, the, the 1918 pandemic, so we fully intend to survive this one. Um, and we're proud to be sponsoring one of the many sponsors of uh, SUMSI. Um, and, you know, I just want to thank uh, everybody at SUMSI for putting this virtual conference together, especially Rudy um, and all the hard work that went into this. I think this is probably our fifth uh, <laughs> prep session, so I, I hope it all goes smoothly. Um, so I'm just going to very quickly run through these slides because I, I think um, if you take a look at uh, what's happened to before COVID-19 has caused no cars on the street, you know, at this point, um, traffic speeds have dropped significantly um, over the years. Um, you know, starting in, um, you know, if you look at this chart from 2013, we were at 8.5 miles per hour in the Midtown core, um, and, and now we're at seven miles per hour. Um, just looking at the big picture, also what's happened that's caused uh, a focus on congestion pricing uh, is the vehicle registrations have increased significantly. The number of vehicles registered since 2012 uh, uh, has gone up by 12%. And the number of private vehicles, believe it or not, entering the CBD has been declining since 06. So everybody who's on this uh, panel, as well as anyone who's listening in, has their theories about what causes congestion, um, you know, freight, construction, um, you know, even some of the great shared mobility uh, initiatives that we've implemented under Commissioner Sada Khan. Um, and Commissioner Trottenberg over the years ha have led to, uh, you know, situations where people might say that it causes some of the congestion. Probably not a lot, but, you know, you're, we're, you're scrunching in bike lanes and pedestrian plazas. At, at some point, it does have an impact. Parking placards, parking issues. We're going to talk a little bit about that, uh, you know, uh, blocking the box, tr uh, traffic infractions. But we're going to really focus very quickly today on ride on the concept of ride hailing and how it's impacted. 
And, you know, if, it's no surprise if uh, you're in any city in the United States, but in particular in New York, um, you know, there has been tremendous growth over the last few years of the number of ride hailing vehicles uh, on the road. Uh, when I left the TLC 10 years ago, it's more than almost tripled in terms of the number of vehicles that are out there. And if you look at that, uh, you know, that purple line, uh, that's the, that's the ride hailing vehicles altogether. You know, the, the yellow line is the yellow taxis. So the mayor tried to cap the number of FHVs, Mayor de Blasio, several years ago. And what ended up happening is a few years went by and for a variety of, of issues pertaining to drivers, the TLC did ultimately cap the number of vehicles. But before then, there was a massive rush uh, until the cap was put into place uh, on the supply to add as many vehicles as possible. So that explains that straight line up. And if you look at the market share, you know, in New York City of four higher vehicles and taxis, um, it's 68% of the rides that the trip volume in 2019, for instance, um, is coming from uh, these new entrants to the market for, you know, uh, they're not so new anymore. Um, so the high volume apps, as we call them, Uber and Lyft, um, they put 2.6 new miles on the road for each mile of pers personal driving. And 42% um, of their time has spent, uh, is spent cruising for passengers, though that had started to um, be tackled by the TLC, you know, in the last year or so by other rules. Emissions have gone up um, for taxis and FHVs, which is no surprise as a result, even though the cars are cleaner overall, um, so, you know, in terms of how they're being manufactured for the last 20 years, uh, emissions have increased by 62% since 2013. And um, in terms of uh, mode replacement, I mean, you know, where are these trips going? Um, what are they taking up? Um, it's unfortunately, I guess, for, you know, ride sharing purposes and uh, shared mobility purposes, uh, it's 50% of, 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 of transit is being replaced. Mass transit and 34% of taxi services are going to the ride hail apps. So, you know, the question is, uh, are we going in the, in the wrong direction and how much sharing is going on? And what is the congestion surcharge that was passed? Um, in, in February of 2019, um, and in, the law was passed in 2018, the governor, Governor Cuomo decided to phase it in. He was gonna start with four hire vehicles and taxis, and they were gonna call it a congestion surcharge, and then he was going to move with the legislature later on, uh, in theory, um, 2021, uh, to basically do it for all other vehicles. And a mad scramble for exemptions took place, but they did actually in February of 20, uh, in February of last year, implement for the first time the congestion surcharge. $2.50 for sh uh, shared trip, uh, for non-shared trips and cabs, two seventy-five dollars for individual for hire vehicle trips. And uh, what they did, they tried to create an incentive for shared rides like VIA um, at 75 cents per person. And they met their revenue targets. I mean, they were supposed to raise 365 million and we believe that they've uh, exceeded that target by the end of uh, last year. And I, I guess what I'm here to report on is when we looked at the numbers, um, and this is unfortunate, you would think that maybe the incentive that was put into place for, you know, uh, Lyft Line, Uber Pool and, and Via, or any type of sharing that could take place, um, even using the taxi cabs, Curb has a partnership with Via. Um, the, the, there's actually less sharing going on since the congestion pricing surcharge was put into place. Um, the, the, weighted, the weighted percentage of completed pool rides is only 13%, um, and Uber had only 7% of its total rides pooled compared to Lyft and Via. I mean, Via is in the business of doing this, so you can see their line on top is, is high with 65%. But uh, it was a bit of a surprise to see that this happened. Um, and, and you could see that the cap went into place. But there, you know, look, there's probably other policies at place here that have caused this to happen. Um, at, at around the same time, the TLC implemented a minimum wage. I'm sure Dawn will, uh, you know, add more color on this because she's the most recent person as our last speaker today uh, as chief of staff for TLC to actually be there. I've been out for 10 years now. Um, Though um, I will tell you that it's very possible that pricing policy has caused uh, this trend to happen. It's possible that trips, trip prices were raised because of utilization rates and minimum wages to try to, to, to balance out other policies. 
but it's too early to tell. But it is a disturbing trend. It's not good. Um, and, you know, even before COVID-19 um, caused, uh, you know, traffic to come to a halt, um, in terms of uh, ideas to throw out there on, on how we can make this a little bit better, maybe reverse the trend, um, you know, it's very possible that uh, if we just exempt shared rides, uh, that could cause more people to share, especially, you know, with the economy turning into what it's turning into. Uh, or another idea I've had for years, which I would love to have implemented, is that, you know, surge or demand pricing during rush hours or peak hours should not be allowed unless people are sharing, that it would need to be mandatory. And we need to have more first and last mile collaborations. You know, some C is very involved with, uh, you know, the first, first and last mile FTA sandbox programs. Um, until recently, New York's uh, MTA hasn't done much, but they did, thankfully, put out a late night transportation RFP, which could do first and last mile with, with shared services, but that was put on hold due to COVID. So, you know, look, right now, what's the future of this? Um, you know, we're supposed to have a, a task force uh, formed uh, pro probably before the end of this year. It didn't happen yet. And the governor has already announced that it's probably unlikely that by January of next year, we're going to be putting congestion pricing charges into effect for other vehicles. Um, however, that during the crisis, uh, there hasn't really been a lot of people protesting um, because there is no business out there. Um, but the taxis and four hire vehicles have, have, have still must pay this congestion charge, which is really like an MTA tax to pay for um, mass transit repairs and so forth. So I don't think it's going to go anywhere soon in terms of what we have now, which is the first step to congestion pricing. I think we're going to be stuck with it because the MTA is, is losing you know, tons of money as a result of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so I don't think there's going to be any taking it away uh, and taking it off the books. And you know, we could sit around and predict what's going to happen, you know, whether personal motor vehicles are going to come in, whether congestion is going to even happen anytime soon. Uh, before the end of this year, whether it's going to be anywhere like it was before, it's highly unlikely. You know, intercity buses are probably uh, going to see some people either being on an unemployment and not coming into the city for the next several months, or they're going to probably take their own motor vehicles. And you're going to see probably more bikes and more people walking because they're afraid of taking mass transit. And you're going to see more far higher vehicles out there as things start to come back. So is anyone's guess, uh, you know, in terms of what's going to happen, in terms of how much uh, congestion there will be, if there is any, in the next year or so. But I can tell you that I, it's highly doubtful that congestion pricing is going to be put into place because the feds and the highway administration um, have not signed off on The governor has kind of just said at this point that it's not happening um, anytime soon because of the pandemic. And I, I don't think they're going to take it off the taxis. So, you know, we've been issuing report cards on this stuff at, um, you know, at the Black Card News. I've been publishing a column there every month. Um, we're gonna, we, we've had a couple of um, report cards where we actually grade um, you know, some of the policies that we put into place. The next one that we're going to publish, we're going to actually do some modeling and try to predict what's going to happen moving forward. Um, so that's pretty much it for me. Um, and now what I'd like to do is uh, stop sharing this PowerPoint and, uh, and, and turn it over to Sarah, um, who, who is going to, I guess, start sharing her uh, PowerPoint as I introduce her. Um, Sarah, can you hear me? Are you there? Are you off mute? Sarah? I am here. Okay, great. All right, so welcome, Sarah. Uh, Sarah's our next speaker. Um, she is the technical programs manager at ITE. Um, she's uh, located in the District of Columbia. She's been there since 2018. Uh, she is an, an architect by trade and a land use planner. Um, she has held various positions over the years, starting out as an architect and then moving into being a town planner in the town of St. Michael's, uh, Maryland. Um, she is going to talk, uh, given um, you know, the work of IT, about the national landscape. And uh, welcome, Sarah. Thank you for joining us today. We're looking forward to hear, hearing what you have to say about what's happening with um, land use and parking policy um, and curbside management uh, around the country. Sarah? 
Yes, thank you so much. So I'm the technical programs manager at ITE and the areas that I work in are complete streets planning and safety. They all overlap with um, uh, curbside management. I also um, assist our board in our um, mobility on demand mobility as a service initiative. So excited to work on curbside management. Um, and we released um, most of what I'm going to talk about back in late 2018 and we continue to evolve those products. So with that. Oh, looks like my screen is frozen. There we go. So with that, um, I'm going to try to paint the national landscape of what's happening in addition to ITE's products. So what is curbside management? It's anything that comes near the curb, interacts with the curb, um, is next to the curb on both the road right away as well as the sidewalk. Um, since our practitioner's guide was released in late 2018, um, you can see the colored um, icons at the bottom of my presentation. You'll notice that they are not in the curbside management practitioner's guide. Um, Micromobility devices were just beginning to drop in cities, so we did not have information um, to advise practitioners on the status of those. Um, we oftentimes see transit and, and freight as traditional, kind of always been at the curb um, uses in addition to parking, but really where we're seeing a lot of innovation is around freight, transit, and parking, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Um, and the third thing I want to mention is flex zones. We're really seeing this become a trend that I think will eventually be standardized and regulated. Um, but you're seeing some innovative cities that are really starting to explore the concept of flex zones. Um, as I mentioned, it's not just the curb. We all kind of know this street section. Every city does it a little bit different. Um, as you can see, there is a curb, curb zone, but there's sidewalk zones, there's buffer zones, um, there's flexible zones, there's the bicycle vehicle transit zones that all kind of overlap. And we have to think about all of these uses interactions and modes um, along the curb when we're thinking about curbside management. So this is the Institute of Transportation Engineers Curbside Management Practitioner Guide. As I mentioned, it was released in December 2018. It was developed by our, our Complete Streets Council. Um, they th really think about from building face to building face when they were writing this um, and doing work. It's not just about bike lanes um, with, our, with our Complete Streets Council. Um, and if you're interested in becoming involved in some of these issues, uh, issues and initiatives, feel free to reach out to me. Um, this was done in partnership with NACTO as well as some other organizations, but I want to give a shout out to NACTO with their curbside management work, in, including their curb appeal um, products, but they also did a heavy lift on assisting us with the curbside management practitioner's guide, because we really see this kind of with the spectrum of transportation professionals. We really see it living with the cities, a little bit with the um, MPOs, and then quite a bit with consultants doing work to assist the city. So we really don't see it widely at a state level, but I'll talk a little bit later about partnerships when looking at curbside data. Um, and we're working on updates to this because as I mentioned earlier, we know that um, this is a space that is constantly evolving and quickly evolving, which we'll talk about on this panel today, of course. Um, so what's included in the Curbside Management Practitioner's Guide? It's everything from available tools and treatments to treatment selection process starting to go through systematically how any transportation professional, let it be someone who's experienced in curbside management, or on the street doing operations and, and inventorying. Um, we also cover um, what is beginning to emerge as performance measurements, um, things that we have to assess and look at on the curb. If you can see the curb um, behind me, um, there's a lot going on at the curb and sometimes we try to put them into pretty buckets as planners like myself, but it doesn't always work out that way. You've got sidewalk cafes, you've got street benches, you've got stormwater management facilities. It's hard to kind of assess these treatments and start to measure performance to know what is the highest priority. So the practitioner's guide starts to do that um, and also discusses additional resources, further considerations and implementation strategies. Um, so as I mentioned numerous times, there's different uses at the curb, there's different land uses that have different demand. And then every city is a little bit different. This is from Seattle Department of Transportation, how they define the function, the mode, the land use, and the interaction in between. 
Um, so the available tools and treatments kind of cover all of those modes that may interact with the curb and why and how they're interacting with the curb. So for transit, um, you have um, uh, pickups and drop offs. You also have car shares. You have ride hailing that have pickups and drop offs. So assessing the time and the, the overlaps of the curb. You've got um, parking demands, which are always seem to be the highest. Um, the assessment of signs at the curb oftentimes um, uncover a lot of interesting things about the way we manage our curbs. You've got pedestrian and bicycles. You've got switch points from different modes. And most importantly, um, you've got loading and unloading zones happening all throughout the day, especially with freight. And we're obviously seeing an increase with that, which I'll talk a little bit about later during COVID-19. Um, so uh, assessing passenger access, loading and unloading zones, the interaction of all those uses that may need the same space of curb all at once. This photo here is actually from an airport. We've seen um, the evolution of taxi cabs to ride hailing pickups and drop offs at airports. And I think the industry learned a lot from that. Um, but in an urban environment, we don't have as much space to kind of designate those different uses. So we're dealing with one curb with very urbanized um, conditions. So inventorying to determine the modal prioritization, um, the treatments to make sure people are using the curb the way we want them to or planned for them to, um, assessing and presenting alternatives when those pilot projects kind of don't work, um, and figuring out how to divide the uses and the modes most safely and most efficiently so that we're keeping people moving and safe um, on our roads. Um, and then don't be afraid to refine and implement. Many cities under their curbside management programs start these projects as pilots. It's okay to test, but make sure you reassess. Um, we're seeing a lot of technologies emerge um, in kind of the private industry to help cities assess their curb, measure demand. There's two here. One is curb, which you'll hear from Dawn later, as well as shared streets. They're all going about it a little bit different. Cities are applying these a little bit different, but I think the vis visualization and inventory tools that are emerging in our industry are really going to help us understand curves, especially as dynamic curves and flex curves emerge as there's more and more demand um, at that curb. Um, treatment selection process is really important to make sure that the users of the curb um, and the people in the built environment understand what we're needing and wanting them to do as transportation professionals. Um, we oftentimes see signs everywhere, um, maintenance of our curbside management, both with signs, markings, um, as well as where we locate things like bike shares, as you see in this photo, switch points, like you see in these photos, getting off the bus and getting on a bike share. Um, so as I mentioned, it's kind of the refine and implementation and identifying the best treatment selection process. The curbside management practitioner's guide starts to get into that. You also see leaders in this, um, in this sector, such as Seattle Department of Transportation, that are kind of um, releasing and understanding their own right-of-way allocation decision process. Um, I would note that Seattle and Toronto have quite a few kind of graphics and processes that they're a little bit further along than everybody else in this area. So I encourage you to um, check them out. We have two case studies, both on, um, on those cities as well as some others. Um, this is San Francisco, um, where you see current and proposed goals. You see that they've done inventories and measurements to explain the revisions to the curbside. They've also um, noted demand. I know this is too small for a lot of you to see, but you're really starting to see inventories connected to treatment selections um, in our practice. Um, this is from NACDO's Curb Appeal. You have many kind of tools in your toolbox relative to curbside management um, and how you deploy those and treatments that you use in order to decide where are you gonna put a food truck versus a parklet versus a park car lane? Um, how are you gonna make those flexible based on demand throughout the day? Because the reality is one use doesn't need to use the curb 24 seven. So I really think you're gonna start to see trends as we kind of understand inventories better, we're gonna start to see more and more relative to dynamics. 
um, treatments and curbs. So performance measures are oftentimes around mobility, livability, accessibility. I will stress we do not want to forget about accessibility when we're doing all of this. Um, there can oftentimes be conflicts that prevent someone from accessing the facilities we are putting in place. So don't forget about the accessibility, keeping people safe so they are not confused where to go, how to go, um, how to change modes along a curb. And then of course, economics and efficiency are important to us as transportation professionals as we plan these curbs as well. Um, performance measures, I'm gonna go through these pretty quickly. Each city um, and project really at a project level is how this should be effect, um, uh, measured, um, is to look at measures of effectiveness and project goals. Um, outlining these all from the beginning are very important. You can look at sales demand. You can look at um, hours of operation when you're approving a new business to go in to figure out exactly what we need at our curb. So this starts to outline some measures of effectiveness and there's a full list in the curbside management practitioner's guide. I want to talk a little bit about types of data collection, which um, Dawn, I think we'll cover a little bit more later with CORD's work, but you have manual data collection. Um, it's not out of date to do surveys of, um, of residents, of business owners. You see some survey results here from SFMTA. You've got automated data collection. This is internal or external that's been automated. It can be from something that's already set up, such as transit, um, transit trips. Um, you've got third party um, data, let it be a third party data provider, or it could be something like a park mobile app that tells you a lot about your parking demand. Um, and then the interagency work. As I mentioned, um, most of these projects are kind of at a, a city level. That doesn't mean the MPOs and the state DOTs don't have overlapping right of way um, and, and or they might have data. There's also a lot that we can learn from the police department, the fire department, um, other agencies within our city government um, to better understand our curb. And hey, maybe we can get the police to help assess the de curb demand. Um, future considerations. I've mentioned dynamic and flexible curbs a number of times. Um, Increased dynamic management technologies. I think we're really seeing apps, things like that, that are really informing um, use of curbside management. Enhanced communication, which I actually just mentioned. Um, rapid changes in land use or slow changes in land use. We really have the power here with um, long-term land use planning to decide what we want our curb to be and how we want both the street and the sidewalk to shape around that as we're making land use decisions. We've got data methods and standards, which are really going to emerge as technologies emerge. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of this, no one thought two years ago when we started writing the practitioner's guide that there would be scooters all over the streets. So adapting to micromobility devices and modes we haven't even thought of yet. Um, and then the concept of switch points um, as well as hubs. Um, and I just noticed a typo in my presentation, um, but switch points are something that is emerging with Federal Transit Administration. Um, this concept of getting off, off a bus, getting on a scooter, um, getting out of your car, getting on a bike share, um, picking up a ride hailing or a car sharing vehicle, all in one spot where everybody switches. Let it be Grand Central Station, Union Station in our cities, um, or getting off the train in a small town, for example. Um, we also want to monitor implementation. So we don't want to forget about open source tools, developing plans and policies that guide our work long term, um, using performance measures to adjust our work, which I mentioned previously. Um, in this photo, in one of these photos here, you'll see that cities are starting to put micromobility parking um, spots on the street versus having it be a free for all on the sidewalks because of sidewalk clutter. Starting to figure those things out and adapting. You're, you, there's also a photo here um, of electrification and recharging of small modes, which I think is important. What we're seeing in cities is that a lot of them are requiring them as development conditions for private land use, but how do we start to put them in the public right of way? 
Um, I'll mention some additional resources and then talk a little bit about COVID-19 and curbside management, things that we're seeing nationally. Um, as I mentioned, ITE, and I put it in the um, chat pod for um, participants today, ITE has a curbside management resource page, which includes all of what I've talked about today. Um, we also have a number of case studies that we released um, a little over a year ago on curbside management, kind of long-term planning citywide in DC, San Francisco, and Toronto. So I would encourage you to take a look at those. We actually just did a webinar checking in on those cities a year and a half later to see what they are continuing to evolve because this is a rapidly evolving space. I will stress that. Um, and stay tuned for more resources from ITE on curbside management. Um, and we'll be doing a call for more case studies because we all learn from each other in practice um, later in 2020. I want to jump really quick to cover um, the elephant in the room, of course, we've all been adapting both personally and professionally to COVID-19. Um, and curbside was kind of one of the spaces we saw cities adapt to first as restaurants closed um, and transit patterns changed. Um, we really saw cities start to adapt at the curb. Um, I've got some tweets here that I had saved and retweeted on my Twitter. Um, back in March, you saw cities like Seattle, Austin, um, uh, and DC really, really work to make sure that the use of the curb was as efficient, safe um, as possible during our times of social distancing with restaurants closing and people still needing to pick up supplies and food. Um, I would encourage you to take a look at our curbs, or sorry, at our COVID-19 resource page through ITE. There's a lot of technical guidance emerging, um, including some things that we're seeing, like we're starting to see COVID testing sites on streets against um, against the curb because there aren't parking lots to do them in urban areas. Um, so check it out. We're, um, we're adding stuff to that any, every day. If you see something relative to COVID-19 and curbside management that you think we should add that's helpful, please reach out to me. I think we're all learning as, as we go. Um, we hosted a virtual drop-in on curbside management. So for those on this that are ITE members, feel free to check out that conversation. I'll also give a shout out to IPMI. Um, who has been doing a series of blogs. They have two so far, one on how parking is adjusting to um, COVID-19 along the curb, as well as public agencies, lessons learned and how they're deploying. And I really think I'll end on a positive note, which is I really think that although we're going through challenges with curbside man or with COVID-19 right now, one of the things that's that's allowing us to learn quickly with all of this is the concept of dynamic and flex curbs and how we really start to do those. Um, so with that, I will um, hand it back to Matt. Thank you, Sarah. Um, appreciate the uh, great, nat it's a great national overview and the, the resource gu guide sounds excellent for practitioners, so uh, great work. Um, we're now gonna drop down a little bit to the, uh, uh, to the regional level and talk about some um, you know, some things that have been put into practice in the Chicago area. So our next speaker uh, is Lindsay. Are, are you live, Lindsay? Are you, is your mic on? Okay, so uh, while you load your um, PowerPoint, I'm going to give you a, a nice intro. So Lin Lindsay actually started um, uh, at the, with the Peace Corps in Guatemala as a municipal planner, and then uh, went to work for Federal Highways as a community planner. And then uh, since 2007, she's been with uh, the Chicago Metropolitan a uh, Agency for Planning, or, or what we know as CMAP, um, first as an associate planner, now as a senior planner. So she focuses on parking policy, equity, um, and uh, she has crafted many reasonable transportation policies, including uh, writing the parking strategies to support livable communities, the parking toolkit, um, you know, a long list of projects that she's worked on. And, she also is going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the new parking reform network uh, in Oregon. And uh, so welcome, uh, welcome, Lindsay. We're looking forward to hearing about your experiences uh, in the region and uh, locally where s some C was supposed to be. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Matt. Um, so as he mentioned at Chicago's MPO, I am today gonna talk about how an agency without an implementation authority can support communities and the importance of pricing in our region. And I'll figure out how to advance slides somehow. Okay, so our last um, 
long range transportation plan called ONTO 2050 focused on three principles, inclusive growth, resilience, and prioritized investment. And each of these principles is even more important in times of COVID-19. Um, we really need to help build our communities back and to build resilient communities, we need that flexibility to respond to the changing conditions. And those might be economic conditions, social conditions, or environmental climate changes. Um, and our municipalities are going to come out of this with enormous financial needs and budget holes, just like many of our residents. And building and maintaining our roadways is a large percentage of local budgets. So introducing the idea of congestion pricing and parking management is really about helping communities work with what they have and manage what is a valuable resource, their space, whether it's a parking space or space on the roadway. Um, we have for a long time been assessing our local infrastructure needs and diminishing gas tax revenue. We successfully advocated for an increase in the gas tax. And we've also supported a shift to a vehicle miles travel tax. And we've looked at congestion pricing and parking pricing and share the pros and cons of those policies. Um, I've worked on parking studies in suburban environments and city neighborhoods. And I do find that while the built environment's different, the parking uh, sit patterns are very similar. People want to park right in front of where they're going and they don't want to pay for it. So while people in the city will walk further, people, um, you still have the parking that's closest to your popular destination that's free, is gonna fill up first, and then slowly the other parking may never even get full, but there's usually enough parking and we're just not managing it well. Um, and so when the conversation usually starts with, we need more parking, I try to shift it to economics. Um, many of you, because building parking is very expensive, so you may be familiar with uh, the law of supply and demand. You've got your demand curve, supply curve, and that point where the lines cross is the equilibrium point. And so this is usually determined by price. So the right price makes it so that suppliers can continue to produce their good and make a profit and demand can be satisfied. And when it and that's the case for just about everything in our society, whether it's your housing, your groceries, your cell phone bill. But when it comes to driving and parking, we don't use price to regulate or to balance supply and demand. Instead, we use time. So how much time are you willing to circle the block looking for parking? How much time are you willing to sit in traffic on your daily commute? And when you're not using uh, pricing, congestion becomes the equilibrium point. And so it is the constant and we can't solve congestion if we're not talking about pricing. Our cities by their nature are places where you have a lot of people and jobs close together. And so you, the space is, becomes even more valuable. And when a person in a car takes up a lot more space than somebody when they're not in a car. And we really want to focus on moving people and goods efficiently. And so a single occupancy lane that doesn't have that congestion pricing isn't really going to help increase our capacity a great deal. But this is historically how we've been addressing congestion. We widened the roadways. And when we don't have congestion pricing and parking policies, we can't solve that problem. We end up investing a ton of money and add on to our long-term maintenance needs and costs without building significant revenues to pay for that in the long-term. So without those congestion pricing, or when, when you have congestion as the equilibrium, we really need to focus on the pricing. But when we do shift to talk, when we do talk about shifting that cost of driving onto the drivers, we suddenly have a lot of people who are very concerned with the potential impacts on equity. And it's great that that question is coming up. It is important, but it's also important to realize that our current system is not very equitable because when we bake the cost of driving and parking into everything, our poorest citizens end up subsidizing the wealthiest. 
who are more likely to drive more and to drive larger fuel efficient SUVs and electric vehicles, which are heavy and they are still damaging our roadways without contributing much to the gas tax. And the, they're still emitting the tire particles and the brake dust, which is hitting our communities who have previously been um, exposed to a lot of environmental racism with highways coming through them. So we really do need to consider all of the equity impacts of our policies that we're enacting, but also recognize that our current system of having everything be paid for by everybody is not equitable. So um, when we are doing our local parking studies, we count a lot of parked cars. And this is a, an example of a turnover survey that we did in Chicago's Chinatown neighborhood. And the spaces shown in red on CERMAC are the metered spaces and the green ones are the free spaces. And we counted cars over the course of seven hours. And while most of the spaces were full the whole time, we were able to show that on average, cars going to the metered spaces aren't staying for more than an hour. So there's a lot of turnover and those are really the workhorse spaces in the heart of Chinatown. And we did the same thing for the Wicker Park neighborhood in Chicago and my graphics have changed since we did that, but uh, you can see the same patterns. And we were able to show this graphic to the local alderman who, when looking at this major commercial corridor, is can recognize that the businesses in the green area where parking is free aren't going to have a lot of turnover because you have cars that were there the entire seven hours. Maybe they've been there for a week. We don't really know. But if your business is there, customers can't find a parking spot. And he quietly added meters onto part of that roadway. But one of the major barriers is that we look at when it's not times of a pandemic, roads full of cars and parking lots full of cars, and we think there's just not enough room, we need to add a lane, we need to build more parking. But it's really about using what we have more efficiently. And if you count the people in these cars, they could very easily fit into a nice little bus. Um, so again, it's really about using what we have more efficiently. Um, so I think that parking reform is crucial to sustainable mobility and equitable communities. And that's why, as Matt mentioned, I have in my free time uh, teamed up with Tony Jordan in Portland, Jane Wilberding in Chicago, and Mike Kwan in DC to create the Parking Reform Network. And um, our goal is to build a movement to advocate for parking reform across the country. And we are developing resources for local chapters. We're collecting research material for members and creating ways for people to connect and support each other. And we have Donald Shoup as one of our advisory board members, and he has approved of the use of his likeness in this sticker that I designed that you can get if you join. Um, and so the, the types of curbside management policies that we recommend at the local level and through Parking Reform Network really are about being flexible to respond to the changes in demand. And at the current moment, what we're really seeing, of course, is the increase in demand for short-term parking, the pickup and drop-off, and we need to think about what those needs are on the curb in different contexts. So some places it's going to be extra space for a bus lane, in some places widened sidewalk, bike, bike lanes, um, and hopefully further down the road when our restaurants can come back open, we can have more space for people who are dining and to be able to be spaced out. Um, we do want to think about some of our policies that might be outdated that we should get rid of like minimum parking requirements because we really can't predict what the demand for parking is going to be and even before coronavirus we were seeing a decrease in the demand for parking in larger cities um, so we really we should stop requiring it and stop baking the cost of parking into our buildings and our built environment um, a lot there's a lot in the technology side that can help us better understand what the demand needs are. And I'm gonna let Jerry talk more about that in a minute. Um, things like geofencing and real-time demand, if he is gonna get into that. Um, 
transportation is really critical to economic development and it's going to be super important when it comes to our recovery. So at the regional level, we will continue to research best practices and encourage communities to think about what the return on investment is going to be when it comes to different development types and the infrastructure needed to support them and really how we can shift the needle from solving congestion to moving people efficiently. And I believe that making reforms to parking and transportation will help our communities prosper and help create that you know, incremental lasting development or economic success and make it so it's more affordable for people who live there and also cheaper for cities to maintain the infrastructure that we've got. So thank you very much. And I will hand it back to Matt who, and Jerry will talk next. I can. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, so Jerry, while you're uh, unmuting your mic and getting your presentation up there, um, I've seen Jerry speak before at some C and uh, um, we're very glad to have him on the panel. Uh, he has a very interesting, uh, unique background. Um, you know, a lot of the people that I run, in, run into it in some C circles are usually not lawyers. They're uh, um, you know, urban planners and engineers and, uh, you know, people who are in that field. But uh, he actually has a technology background and a marketing background, um, having worked as vice president uh, for Brand Muscles, uh, for Brand Muscle as well as Quantum Leap, before taking over as uh, executive director of the Illinois Autonomous Vehicle Association, where he has broad, a broad range of responsibilities on policy operations, project oversight, and today he's going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, while Lindsay and Sarah spoke about, you know, the tools and the resources available and some of the policies and, um, and the dynamics that go into curbside management, he's going to talk about the technology, how it works and what's behind the, uh, what's behind the curtain, so to speak. So Jerry, uh, welcome. Um, I'm a big Curb Your Enthusiasm fan, so I'm glad you're starting with a photo of Larry David. Uh, welcome. <laughs> Well, I, I think the, the curb is obviously one of the, the points of, um, of, of stress and, and challenge uh, as we talk about the roadways. So what better than to set up a conversation about it than, hey, everybody, I know you're excited about this topic or you wouldn't be here, but let's curb our enthusiasm for a second. Uh, let's try to put it all into perspective. Thank you very much, Matt. I appreciate it. And um, Lindsay and Sarah, thank you for your uh your setup because it, it's going to tee up what I'm going to talk about, which is some of the technologies that are emerging, not only from, um, from a vehicle standpoint and the things that we can expect vehicles to start to do in the future, um, as well as what they can do today, but also start to think about um, what the infrastructure is and how all that works. As both of them talked about and touched on, data is going to be at the core of this. And so you'll see very heavily, I'll talk to all of that. But let's start with vehicles of today and into tomorrow, you know, um, are, they're going to have more and more automated functions. And I'm not just talking about cars that drive themselves, but think about the recent vehicles that you've driven. Did it have cruise control? Did it have assisted braking? Do you have to access, do you have access to routing software that gets you from point A to point B in the most efficient manner? Did you get entertained via satellite services like Sirius while you were in the vehicle? Or perhaps, your vehicle had become a hotspot to ensure that your kids' Wi-Fi's were rolling in the background to watch some sort of Nickelodeon program. All of these things are turning vehicles into portals of data and communication systems that we're only beginning to scratch the surface of. Now, think for a second about your car and the various systems on your vehicle. Think of those systems starting to connect with one another. Think of vehicles starting to connect with one another and vehicles starting to connect with infrastructure to manage traffic, manage parking, manage my entertainment options, manage my payments for services. That is what mobility of the future is gonna be. Our vehicles are no longer this object of our affection, but rather a portal into the world. Very similar to how your cell phone became something that you used to call people on and now accesses everything you need and enables you to be more efficient in your own lives. We denote these communication channels from the vehicle to those things we would connect with in very specific ways. I'm sure many of you have seen this sort of structure we talk about. Uh, some are very direct and concise, vehicle to vehicles, communicating 
with one another, vehicles talking to pedestrians, but some of them are a little bit more ambiguous. Vehicle to infrastructure can include connected infrastructure elements like smart traffic lights, traffic cameras, traffic management sensors, parking sensors, curbside IoT elements. Then you have the most abstract, which is vehicle to network. And nobody really ever understands this unless you're really, really a heavy engineer. But really vehicle to network is when data is streamed to the cloud or to the fog or to the edge. If you don't know what the fog is and you don't know what the edge is, those are new terminologies in which we're, it's not streamed up to sort of a central area, but it's really just these sensors talking to one another. And because the compute power of IoT devices is becoming so much more and more uh, savvy, these sort of communications of machines talking to machines can happen without anything backhauling to a database and, and querying a database. That's gonna allow these decisions to be made and these collaborations to only further and further enhance what we're doing at a faster and faster rate. Let me talk a little bit about what that means and I'm, I, I get to share, when you connect to the network, here Bosch has outlined for us and I'm using this uh, with their permission, uh, a host of new connections that can occur. Again, the vehicle is no longer this thing that brings you to and fro. It becomes an agent of enablement, not just taking you to where you're going, but becomes a node on the network of other connected vehicles, other connected systems that provide move people, goods, services in a smooth and frictionless manner. Here we see that small subset of connected services in Bosch and Bosch is not only the world's second largest automotive tier one supplier, but Bosch is also in a very unique position because they're also one of the world's leading infrastructure components and frankly, one of the largest IOT device components ever. Everyone take two seconds and pick up your cell phone. 95% of you have a Bosch device in that cell phone. And that's how prolific this organization is. So as you can see, there's a lot of different things that are gonna be interconnected that relate to mobility uh, and, and a lot of the things that we're talking about. There's other companies besides Bosch working on this. Another, another enabler of core connectivity technology is Cisco who's launched their kinetic architecture, as you see here, to connect a variety of systems into one platform for municipalities. So this is a platform-based solution that allows third-party applications to aggregate a, 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 an immense amount of data from a lot of different uh, domains, whether they be city domains, whether they be third-party domains or others, and enable cities and municipalities to actually process all of those and turn data into information. One thing I'll say about data is data is good, but it doesn't really have value until you give data context. It doesn't create information until there's context. And you really don't get context from your data until you match it up with something, some other data point, some other piece of information or piece of data. And that's what is really important when we talk about this system of systems that's being developed, is really to understand that you have to have, and the more you have, the richer your insights become and the better your solutions can be built off of. So Cisco has this system that brings everything together. Think about that for a moment. Parking, waste management, environment, safety, and security, urban mobility all entail some form of mobility. The point I'm making is don't be so quick to think that mobility is just bikes, scooters, cars, trains, trucks, roadways, curbs. Mobility is much more than that. Mobility is the circulatory system of any given geography. It's the thing that gets everything to and fro. It brings life, it brings health. When we talk about economic downtrodden areas, I can guarantee you there's a transportation issue in that environment. Whether that transportation is of people or of businesses and freight, or of services. Connecting these various systems to work more fluidly is nothing more than clearing our arteries and making sure that all that plaque is removed so that we can really revitalize any geography. We're seeing companies use this technology to do things in a commercial way and clear paths and use data to optimize those paths in routing software. Freight and package delivery companies have to do this because literally their cost per mile is relative to their profitability. 
And so the data inputs they have and the more data inputs they have enable them to make better and better decisions. Here we see one example, uh, Badger, which is a software that provides routing for delivery, um, optimizing you know, a route on the left to an optimization on the right. And the more and more data inputs that these optimization softwares get, the more and more efficient they get. Well, if we can be using these for freight and, and commercial deliveries, why wouldn't we wanna be using these on all the vehicles out on the road? Our largest point of friction for them is the stop itself though. It's not just the routing. So instead of wasting time and not having access to the curb, what do we see? We see freight deliveries double park. The challenge with that is it creates friction for the rest of the traffic. So cities send out ticket writers and write tickets in the hopes of finding them for their behavior. But alas, companies like UPS and FedEx have actually built that cost into their service. So drivers can turn their tickets into companies and companies then negotiate settlements with municipalities. It's the cost of doing business. What municipalities are, are missing out is on the option that the curb can be a source of revenue and new technologies are gonna afford us the opportunity to optimize those flex curbs and not to lose any funding or maybe even enhance revenue generation at the curb. Let's talk about really quickly, um, and this dovetails with uh, what Sarah was showcasing earlier. Here's an example of what happens in a traditional designed streetscape um, this is from um, NACDO. And as you can see, any car that double, any truck or van that double parks or cars that double park, because we have parking along the roadway, becomes a point of friction. So when you add in some of these street and curb spaces to allow more efficient flow of operations, what we get to see is you can start to see that this flex curb and this flex space really starts to open things up. But remember that flex curb and that flex space is also limited. NACTO uh, showcased this in a 3D drawing. And it's not just public entities that are getting in in this conversation. Uber actually did street designs and suggested what a street design should look like for them as well. And funny enough, it's very, very similar to exactly what Sarah showed earlier. But how can we use technology to really enhance that limited opportunities that we're talking about? How can we really use technology to micromanage the curb. Well, Bosch has an idea uh, and, and they're applying this idea currently. And this is going to showcase, this example is going to quickly showcase the, the breadth of technologies that they have. So they have in-vehicle technologies, they have on-street infrastructure technologies that they're utilizing. The in-street in technologies that they're using, utilizing is, if you look at the, the image on the top, it's this little puck. It's a sensor that basically pings out uh, to see if there's anything standing within a parking space area. The camera to your top right is not just a camera that's taking video, which is really cool. It's actually doing all of the processing of the information of the video on the camera. And the camera itself has the ability to then send data, not video, data information back down to the puck, to the vehicle, to infrastructure segments. They're using this in combination with the technology that they actually have on their vehicles uh, in Daimler vehicles uh, in closed parking garage environments, but they're almost, I think towards third quarter of this year, they're looking at applying the same sort of technology out on roadways and, and looking for city and municipal partners to work with in order to deploy the same technology that they're using in a closed environment of a parking garage into a more open environment like street parking. This pilot is actually being deployed, uh, I believe in San Francisco or maybe San Jose, as well as in Munich. That's not the only technology company that's also deploying some solutions. Our partner uh, in Chicago, City Tech Collaborative, is running an advanced mobility initiative. And two of their key programs uh, result, relate to the curb and the curb management, which only shows the strength of this topic. The first one they did was a data alone idea. It was about delivery congestion reduction. It was the notion, and they partnered with here, Accenture, UPS, and Microsoft, where they had evaluated actual data delivery to determine if routing and curbside optimization could be made. Using a known congested area in Chicago and taking the data from there, 
here conducted an analysis with data from 23 UPS vehicles across seven routes over a one month period from October to November 2018. The pilot demonstrated opportunities to merge data and delivery activities into a more cost effective and congestion reducing road sharing technique for both the delivery carriers and the customers. The idea and the, the outcomes first, merge data with delivery activities. So data of how congested the curb is, what traffic flows are happening, what the delivery plan is for those vehicles, and then modify delivery activities against those to optimize them. They also were able to ID peak delivery times through the course of the day. Why is that important? Well, if you're a municipality, wouldn't it be great to know that this one hour chunk of the day is worth, the curb is worth more than these other hours during the day? You then could create variable pricing at the curb because data is gonna allow us to do this and connectivity within the vehicles as well as within um, your, your infrastructure is gonna afford you the opportunity to do that. For the companies that were doing the deliveries, there was huge increases in efficiencies of routing. And not only the idea of, of optimizing their own routing, but also they recognize the fact that cities are going to potentially do variable pricing down the road. And this is affording them the ability to stay ahead of the curve and stay efficient and stay optimized. The final thing, and this is huge for cities as well, is congestion reduction. This is where systems talking to other systems is really going to afford us the opportunity to bring all of that together and really reduce congestion and reduce choke points because the machines are really going to want to do that to optimize. This wasn't the only program they did. They also did uh, another uh, curbside management approach and they're working on this now. They partnered with Bosch here, Stantec, Terralytics, Spot Hero, and Carrier Direct. The pilot leads and team members are going to develop the partnerships, data capabilities, and business models, and the technologies required to improve curbside operations through a dynamic management system for short-term curb use. So now they're taking a, a variety of different infrastructure developers, uh, parking folks, uh, mapping folks, and, and infrastructure OEMs to really look at the value of the primary curbside users the trade-offs between the individual and shared benefits, economic model information for dynamic management business models associated with appropriate or proportional use and value, right? Which starts to give us an understanding of, of truly that value of that curb on a real-time basis and a variable basis. And then serve as a model for the, the potential sec second phase of the implementation, which is that fully dynamic managed short-term pickup and drop-off space relative to the curbside pressures to create efficiencies for users, whether that be freight, rideshare, pedestrians, customers, residents, all of the above. So as you can see, there's a lot of technology that's being tested, developed, and deployed. The solutions are absolutely still nascent. Both public and private entities are engaged but not always together. Some of the collaboration we see is emerging, but the reality is, is in this world of our circulatory system, there isn't a difference between public and private because all of these decisions, as I showcased, are gonna be made by technology. They're gonna be made in the cloud. They're gonna be made at the fog. They're gonna be made at the edge. And so no longer can we live in a world in which public manages their business and private manages their business. It just doesn't work that way. And that's where we're seeing a lot of the, the hurdles and the challenges and the roadblocks in terms of moving this technology forward. That's not to say we can't continue driving down a separate but equal path, but recognize at some point it's all going to have to come together. One truth holds true. We're not going to be building, uh, no one person is going to be building an entire system of systems. No one's going to own the system. It's going to be more of a universe where technology is generating data, data is being shared and utilized to be transformed into information, and information is going to be used to solve real-world friction points. And until we have a true system of systems where systems are able to not only talk and share, but are willing and able to talk and share with one another, are we going to get to that point where we get a frictionless environment that's enabled by technology? The cool part is the technology exists. 
much of what I talked about has existed for years. It's about us just deciding that this is the right opportunity, this is the right time, and this is the right place, and really tear down a lot of the Chinese walls that have been built up over time. And that's what our association does. We've been very proud to continue to do that work, uh, working on behalf of, of both the private public sector and bringing academic, academia into it. That to us is it, just a, in a top line nutshell, a lot of the things that are going on uh, and some of the technologies that are being deployed. And as you heard from Sarah and Lindsay, it's important. And I know our next speaker is gonna really talk about how they're deploying some of that and, and utilizing some of this data and analyzing some of this data in a way that brings some of these solutions, these Mason solutions together as well. So thank you very much for your time. Excellent, thank you, Jerry. Or as Larry David would say, pretty, pretty good. Um, very informative. Um, our next speaker, um, while she's loading up her presentation, is someone I've known for um, over 10 years. Her name is Dawn Miller. Um, unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to work with her at TLC because she came and joined the agency a few months after I had left. But uh, she's been very gracious over the years, not only to um, you know, be a member of the IETR, but also to come and spend a lot of her free time to teach some of our graduate students at City College. So thank you for that over the years, Dawn. Uh, she started out as a research associate at Urban Institute, uh, was worked for the Regional Plan Association, and then joined the TLC and worked her way right up the, uh, the chain, uh, from policy analyst to uh, director of office, the Office of Policy and External Affairs. Then she became the director of research before coming uh, the, the prior chairperson's um, chief of staff. And she left recently, uh, recently being last fall, to join uh, CORD as the head of policy and partnerships. So welcome, Dawn. It's good to see you again. And I know that you're going to be um, the closer here with uh, the last presentation talking about uh, curbside policies and management, uh, emphasizing freight a little bit. But also, we'd love to get your thoughts on uh, congestion pricing. And in light of everything I'm hearing, I'm, not one, I'm wondering whether we even need congestion pricing if all of these uh, curbside policies and flex policies work. So welcome, Dawn. It's great to have you and great to see you again. You too. Thanks so much, Matt. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks so much for tuning in today. Um, and I'm very pleased to be part of this discussion. So um, as one of the panels, oh, uh, yes, yeah, so as one of the panels, uh, New Yorkers, I'd like to take this opportunity to share um, some of the lessons learned from New York City's congestion pricing story. Um, after that, I'll talk a little bit about curb management and congestion generally and how it fits in the COVID-19 era. And finally, I'll talk about the role I expect technology will play in curb management in the coming years. So my guess is that many of you out there actually know more about congestion pricing from kind of a, a technical perspective than I do. Uh, so the part of the New York City story that I want to share is political. Uh, congestion pricing is an extremely difficult policy to get past, and other cities pursuing it could potentially learn um, from why it passed in New York City this time around. Uh, so one thing that has really haunted congestion pricing efforts has been, in, in my view, too much focus on congestion itself and traffic speeds. Uh, the, the conversation also gets too focused on payment itself. Um, and the thing is, I don't really think the average person believes that charging a fee is going to get them anywhere faster and no one likes to pay money. Um, so this time around, activists were laser focused on what the money will buy. So in this case, better transit service. The advocacy focus was on the benefits to transit, not traffic speeds, not paying money. Uh, they also made the pain of the status quo, which was deteriorating transit service, very concrete. The Riders Alliance and Advocacy Group collected and published a book of subway horror stories uh, from real riders, and they held a book release party outside the governor's office. They also held a worst commute of the week contest and encouraged riders to share their stories with the governor through social media. So they made the pain and the benefits very real. Another thing they did was make the target of their advocacy clear. The New York region has a maze of transportation agencies. Uh, this is confusing to the public and creates opportunities for politicians to blame one another for system failings and not take responsibility. 
So the advocates made it very clear who really had control over the transit agency, and that was Governor Cuomo. They solidified this with a popular hashtag known as Cuomo's MTA to keep pressure on the person who has the most power over the MTA. The other thing that happened at, um, in this era is that the MTA, MTA hired a very talented and popular agency head named Andy Byford. So his initiatives were yielding results and seeing improvements gave the public and legislators um, more confidence that investing more money in the agency would actually result in real improvements. And last but definitely not least, advocates showed the faces of the people who are hurt by poor transit service. And although in New York pretty much everyone rides transit, the people who are hurt the most by the bad service and suffered the longest, least comfortable commutes were lower income and communities of color. So the advocates showed that the issue for what it really is, congestion pricing isn't just a transportation or economic development issue, though, though it is both of those. Uh, it's also a racial and economic justice issue. So the coalition behind it this time was bigger and included groups that New York elected officials know need access to better opportunity. So now I'll move on to my, my current focus, which is curb management. So first I thought it'd be helpful to break out what I see as two types of congestion. Uh, there's acute congestion, which I show on the left. Uh, this can take place anywhere, even in a city where traffic volumes aren't generally out of control. Uh, there are, and um, you, hmm, excuse me. Um, even in a city where, um, then there's overall congestion, which I show on the right. Um, this, is, this is where there is, are just way too many cars for the network to accommodate. Um, of course, the two concepts are related, uh, but it can be helpful to define the two. So when people talk about curb management, there's this inclination to picture those acutely congested curbs. However, curb pricing and other parking policies can actually also be used to address overall congestion problems. Um, so a city can, you know, as one example, a city can require garage owners to charge by the hour rather than by the month. When you've paid for a month of parking, you've invested in this mode and are unlikely to take another. It's different when you're paying for each individual hour. When that's the case, you, um, you're making a purchase decision each day and are more likely to sometimes take other modes when they make more sense. Seattle is a leader in using parking pricing to address congestion. So they have a goal of reducing circling for parking by, re by targeting one or two available spaces on every block. And so they achieve this by analyzing parking occupancy relative to supply and adjusting prices up or down. Digital curb technology makes this analysis easier and enables you to analyze your situation and reprice accordingly more often and at a more granular level. Now, one of the topics that comes up a lot when we talk about acute congestion and double parking is the growth in e-commerce. But unfortunately, it's also a source of overall congestion. A recent report by the World Economic Forum showed that only about 30% of e-commerce related delivery traffic is offset by a reduction in individual shopping traffic. And there are a lot of people experimenting with programs to address the challenges from e-commerce. Uh, the WEF analyzed a variety of interventions, things like parcel lockers to urban consolidation centers to drone delivery. Um, and what really jumped out at me from this report um, was that of all the interventions, improvements in loading zones and double parking enforcement were projected to have the greatest impacts on congestion. The other thing that jumped out at me is that pretty much all the positive impacts that are shown here in blue disappeared if they are not mandated by the government. So even though we see delivery companies are innovating, um, they focus their efforts on what most improves the customer experience and, and the bottom lines for their businesses. Um, much less of their focus is on, on addressing congestion. Um, therefore, strong government policy is going to be necessary to address congestion and emissions. Now I'll talk a little bit about e-commerce as it relates to our current crisis. So this chart is another, is another one from the WEF report. And along the x-axis, it shows the change between 2017 and 2019 in purchasing various sorts of items online. Um, and so we all know online shopping has been growing, uh, but there's a lot of variety among categories. So even in 2017, lots of toys, clothing, and computers were bought online. 
Um, but even in 2019, groceries and health products were still mostly bought in the store. Um, and then there's a lot of, infer of items in between like furniture and baby care. So in the COVID-19 era, so many of us have shifted our shopping online. And for many of us, this includes perhaps for the first time, groceries and health products. Uh, when we can one day return to the store without worrying about it, many of us will have formed a new online shopping habit in a new category. So this suggests to me that COVID-19 will have a real lasting effect of accelerating the pre-existing trends towards more online shopping. Another notable and, and really sad uh, impact of COVID-19 is of course on the mun municipal budgets. So the National League of Cities and the US Conference of Mayors surveyed cities and found that the majority are losing revenue from sources like permit service and utility fees and sales taxes. Uh, and many are losing revenue from state aid, property taxes, and income taxes. Um, and cities of all sizes, as you see on the right, um, expect they will have to cut public services and sadly furloughs are already happening around the country. So I expect that a confluence of factors, this lasting growth in e-commerce, strain on municipal budgets, and eventually congestion will return, uh, will re result in more cities charging for loading space. So Seattle, Chicago, San Francisco, New York already charge drivers for loading time. Uh, and I've had a lot of conversations with cities that were already interested in charging drivers for loading time before COVID-19. And I think recent events are likely to really accelerate this process. Uh, and I'll finish up by speaking a little more specifically about technology. So when I think about technology in curb space, I think about curb space as a service that a city provides. Uh, we think intentionally about providing city services for things like senior centers or 911 response or trash pickup. We can, we can also think intentionally about how we provide access to the curb. And one element of curbside service is what we choose to provide. Are we dedicating this space only to long-term vehicle storage or do we account for a variety of community needs and desires? Things like space for quick turnover parking or loading in commercial areas, space for transit, cycling, pedestrians, or space for beauty and street life like parklets, streeteries, greening, and food trucks. So without digital curb information, deciding what to provide where is a daunting task and change can tend to occur on a more reactive rather than proactive basis. But with digital curb data, reviewing allocations relative to priorities makes larger scale reallocation decisions far more feasible. So this is both from an analytical standpoint and a community engagement standpoint, since planners have better access to data to explain trade-offs and impacts. A second element of curb service is how we provide it. Navigation and transit apps using real-time traffic and transit data has now become mainstream parts of how we all get around. Uh, similarly, we can use technology to make locating and paying for loading and parking space a seamless part of these digitally guided trips. We're part of the way down this path already. Uh, in many cities, you don't need a pocket full of quarters or even a credit card to pay for parking. You can use your mobile phone to pay, uh, but we're only part of the way there. Right now, drivers are heavily reliant on interpreting a set of metal signs to figure out where they can stop, load, or park. Of course, signs on the street can't disappear entirely, but they can become more flexible. So if a city signs a space as a flexible zone and then digitally communicates to drivers through mobile apps who may use the curb, at what price, and for how long, they can more easily change how space can be used. In the short term, they can change allocations in response to special events, construction, or emergencies, as we've seen them do with COVID-19 crisis. In the long term, they can change allocations as priorities change, or modal mix changes, or to adapt to new technologies like autonomous vehicles. And in either case, the users know what to expect and where to go because cities are di communicating digitally with their curb users. Uh, and this isn't some sort of theoretical technology, it, it's available today. Um, and with the trend towards charging for loading space I mentioned earlier, I think a lot of cities have an opportunity. Rather than just beginning to charge for loading space, they can couple with policy, this policy with providing a better curb service. They can create more loading space when and where it's needed. They can use technology to help drivers reliably locate available space. And both of these save drivers time and aggravation. 
Um, so they're getting something of value for their, for their payments. And so I'm not gonna claim that every company that does deliveries is gonna be clamoring to begin paying for loading space, um, but cities can enter those conversations on strong footing when they make the case, not only that it's fair to charge these drivers for using public space, but also that they're providing an enhanced service for these drivers. Um, and so that's it for me in terms of the presentation. Thanks to all for sticking around um, and, and for your attention and to my, my fellow panelists and I'm looking forward to, uh, to questions if, if we have any time to, to fit those in. So thanks very much. Yes, uh, thank you, Dawn. We actually, we do have time for about 10 minutes for some panel discussion. Um, first of all, I wanna thank all the panelists for their great presentations and also for answering many of the questions already on the screen from some of the, uh, the attendees. So that's the first thing. Um, so I guess the first question, um, I throw this out to multiple people on the panel, whoever wants to answer first, is obviously the COVID-19 pandemic is on everybody's minds. So I'm sure there's a, a lot of bandwidth being spent, um, you know, trying to figure out what's going to happen in the short term, the long term, uh, impact on, you know, modal, modal shift, whether it's temporary or permanent. Um, you know, so how do you believe that that impacts the uh, curbside management uh, scenario and also whether we even need congestion pricing. I mean, the more I listen to everybody here, the more it sounds to me like curbside management is not a luxury or an option. It's really a necessity in a post-COVID world. So I, I want to throw those questions out there um, to the panel, especially at this time of, you know, budgetary strain for cities, obviously, in light of what's happened and will happen. Um, how do you even pay for all this stuff? So. Uh, who wants to take that one first? It's a loaded question, but I think uh, <laughs> this panel can handle yeah. it. I can, I can, I think, address some of that. Okay, Don. Um, you know, I think we have to think in kind of the the long term, um, in like the kind of the long term, the immediate term, and the near term. Uh, in in the long term, con congestion will return, and I think um, all of the policies that um, like New York's will again become relevant and very important. Um, there's also this medium term of which I consider the time in which cities are recovering. Um, and part of that recovery will be, um, you know, finding opportunities to um, plug up those holes in their budgets. Um, and, and, and doing things like charging appropriately for curbside space is a way they can do that. That's also good policy. It's what I think a lot of planners have wanted to do for a long time. Um, but it may get the attention um, and support it deserves um, because, because of the budgetary imperative um, that cities are facing. And I think there's an interesting, like far shorter term issue to think about, um, you know, Sarah and others, I think talked about some of the kind of immediate crisis response things like creating the food delivery zones and things like that. Um, this next stage that we see cities moving into will involve um, trying to keep their businesses afloat um, and, and looking to do things like we've seen um, in, in other countries where they're, where they're taking up street space to um, provide restaurant space so they can get a socially distant dine-in service uh, started again. And so I think that's really great. Um, but then you have to think, well, how, how do the deliveries to and from those businesses happen then? So I think there's um, some kind of curbside management that needs to happen on the kind of perpendicular and parallel streets to create space um, for access to those to those streets that have been repurposed um, for commerce um, and but still we need to provide access for for goods and people so I think there's um, some interesting kind of um, you know work this summer and fall in in, in that part of the recovery mm -hmm. okay uh, yeah, Sarah, did you want to add something? I'll add just, just two things, um, kind of the pre-COVID world to the post-COVID world and curbside management is one, what was interesting is we saw certain noteworthy cities um, were deploying different tactics. We saw some were deploying emergency response tactics. Some were deploying, like Austin and San Francisco were deploying their kind of major event strategies. So I think we have the tools in our toolbox to kind of adjust. I don't think that the post 
COVID world will necessarily be different. I think there's opportunities in this relative to curbside management to realize we can adapt quickly to things. And I, you mentioned budget concerns. Um, and I think that parking revenue, other forms of revenue along the curb are going to be a discussion. Um, but I would also note that a lot of these things we need to do, these tactile urbanism things, these treatments that we talk about relative to curbside management aren't that, not, aren't that much. Um, and even the apps are pretty open source, some of them. So they aren't huge infrastructure burdens um, to our cities. If you, if you really think about it in the grand scheme of things, we can change a lot at the curb with not much money. You know, it's it's um, if I could redirect that comment to Jerry, actually, um, you know, just to elaborate the, a little bit more on the technology side of it. Um, you know, what really jumped off the screen um, to me, in addition to Larry David, uh, was the um, you know the concept of universal 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 uh, applications, um, and you know, uh, Sarah mentioned open source. Um, you know, standardization of, of connectivity, whether it's, uh, you know, B to I or P to I, if you want to call it that, you know, if we're going to start using phones for micro mobility management and, 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 and parking, shouldn't the Uber driver, the taxi driver, the bus driver, and the private motor vehicle driver all be able to have some type of standardized technology in all OEM vehicles moving forward? If we really want the connected technology to have real time consequences to, to making, you know, the, the, the flex spaces and the other curbside management techniques work because even, you know, my biggest fear is that uh, most people don't know about it. They don't have the technology and they're still resorting to Googling some random uh, sites to try to figure out where the spots are and the fairness issue of what's this spot being, or this space being used for now and later so they can avoid uh, violations. So, I'm just wondering if, if there's a movement in terms of the standardization of um, the technologies talking to each other, both on the infrastructure side, uh, vehicles, apps. Uh, is, there, is there a movement to put on that yet or is that far away? There's a lot and I think it falls into two buckets. And so the term I'd use is, is there's standardization of, of data, uh, which allows for much more efficient interoperability. And that's the key term is interoperability. It's not so much about standardization. It's not so much about open source. It's about the idea that, that your, your data and your system can be interoperable. And I can tell you, interoperability of systems is something that is universally happening uh, across the world in a variety of sectors. Um, and, and it's a way in which legacy systems can also be an inter interoperable with new systems that are being developed. And I think that's sort of more of the philosophy um, because standardization takes a long time. Um, it really does. It takes a lot of partnership, a lot of collaboration um, to build standardizations. That's not to say on a micro basis standardizations in certain pockets of this system of systems aren't happening. Uh, it is. Um, and we're seeing lots of attempts at standardization and we're fully supportive of standardization. But what we don't want to do, what we don't think is necessary is an overburdening of that when unnecessary, when we can find sort of interoperable ways for uh, systems to work together. And keep in mind, information doesn't necessarily have to flow, certain information doesn't necessarily have to, is not immediate information, right? There's information that actually can be delayed. And so there's, again, a lot of different ways in which this information can flow and be interoperable. But I think that's, that to me is the sort of, um, the, the approach that we see out there is, is this notion of, and this concept of interoperability and building systems that are dynamic and stacked in a way that you can become more interoperable with others. Well, it's, it's definitely good to hear that that's, that's already happening on its own to some extent. Um, you know, and we're running out of time, but I, I wanted to direct the last question to Lindsay. Um, you know, um, from, you know, the government standpoint, um, you know, CMAP and planners, uh, you know, how do we view the post-COVID world in terms of the budget? Uh, do, do you see that there's more room here for public-private partnerships, um, you know, as we move forward since uh, budgets and uh, uh, whether it's the federal money being handed out or being planned to be used or 
you know, local transit and other budgets. Um, in a post-COVID world where, uh, from an economic standpoint, it's not just um, from shared mobility being banned in certain cities like New York for now, but, but also the distancing that's going to take place on bus and, buses and trains, that's going to cause an even bigger, um, you know, economic crunch on sustainable modes because the whole concept of shared mobility and sustainability is that you want to push people away from cars and into group settings and that seems to be something that's thrown completely out the window at this point so um, I guess my question is in a post-COVID world these budgetary implications for for governments are going to become even worse so um, in, in your work at CMAP and now with the uh, the new venture that you're involved in Lindsay do you see um, more room for public-private partnerships um, for some of these curbside management, uh, you know, uh, products that are out there and technologies? Well, I think that there are opportunities for partnerships, um, but I think we would caution against the shiny object syndrome of not jumping on to try to implement something new and exciting and think about what we can do that can use what we have better before going really far into something really fancy. And there are so many simple changes to our streets that we can look at. And instead of storing private property, what better uses can we make of the curb when that's not generating any revenue and it hasn't been for so long? And just think a little bit more outside the box. And I don't think we're going to be getting back to a normal, uh, like. Back to normal, I think there's, we'd like to see if we can get to a new normal and hopefully that's a better normal. And I think that we're going to be able to understand where we have our essential transit services, where are the lines that you're not seeing a huge drop in ridership and where can we beef those up so that you are serving the most vulnerable, the people that don't have choices. And I think the data that comes out of this is going to be really helpful for that and yeah, I don't know if anyone else wants right. to jump in on that. Yeah, and it could be like what like Dawn mentioned earlier. I mean, um, you know, when people think of congestion pricing, they say, what's in it for me, right? Um, you know, am I gonna get a better uh, experience if I pay more? And I, it sounds to me like, like the movement politically uh, may not have the same steam if there's no congestion, but um, politically, it could pick up a, a new level of steam, which is that public transit and government needs money and people who use, just like the gas tax, should be taxed for it, uh, irrespective of whether it reduces congestion or whether we have congestion. It could end up being just almost like another tax potentially, right? So um, I don't know if anybody has any parting thoughts on that concept, since we did try to marry together the curbside issue with congestion. Um, anybody have any parting thoughts on, on that issue? I, I would hope not that, that we're taxing uh, folks for the use of public transit only because there's such a significant, one of the things COVID did was identify for us so clearly where the gaps in public transit were for those who needed it, right? Um, how inefficient it is for those who absolutely rely upon it. Uh, so my hope would be that we find new ways to um, to develop and fund mobility um, in all of these new sources of information that we have to develop new fund funding sources and not necessarily put taxes back on our public transit system um, mm -hmm. and 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 the riders and users of those public transportation systems because I think especially in urban environments that's going to only widen the gap of of equity. Yeah. yeah, and I wanted to add on to, I think, some things that Sarah and Lindsay were getting at, um, which is a lot of, I think, when people think about um, innovation in their city, um, they they do get a little bit um, scared off by, like, like Jerry showed us a lot of really cool um, technologies, but that all looks expensive, some of it is very expensive, um, especially if you want to do it at a scalable level. Um, but things like reallocating your space um, to different uses um, requires work, um, but that's not necessarily expensive. Um, and there are a lot of technologies that 
are are new in software, but you know, like you know, they run on smartphones and PCs, and most people already have smartphones and PCs. So I th I think innovating um, doesn't doesn't have to be as expensive. I often get that question: What kind of smart city technology do I need to work with you? And and the answer is none. Um, and I I think that. Um, I think that people would be pleasantly surprised at how much can be done using a lot of the technology we already have and innovation in policy and regulation. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's a fair point. I mean, yeah, and I just wanted you to think about equity, right? Um, point. I'm sorry, Sarah, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to echo Lindsay's earlier point of the new normal. I think we can take lessons learned from this and again, adapt and really start looking at these things holistically. A number of the Q&A questions were about, well, how do I do curbside management and parking reform? And the answer is together. Um, I mean, I think that's what COVID is going to teach us is that all of these things, like look at them holistically um, along the curb, next to the curb. Um, that's how you get there. And I think that's what COVID is teaching us um, very quickly. Well, we certainly have a lot of work ahead of us. Um... Uh, well, we are over our time limit now, so I want to just thank all of our panelists and uh, Rudy and everybody who helped put this together. Uh, I believe we've recorded it and uh, we're on to other sessions. And uh, so thanks, everybody. It was truly a pleasure. We can go on talking about this all day, but we are out of time. So until next time we meet, uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and thank you, everybody.